Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. The most important question that anyone will ever have to answer is this. Who is Yeshua HaMashiach? That is, who is this one called Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ? If you don't know the biblical answer to that question, you will have eternal disaster. It's just that simple. And thanks be to God that we have Scripture that tells us exactly what we should believe about him so that we know the truth and the truth will set us free. Now, I'm sure that most of you have heard that verse, verse, the one that says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The question that you should ask yourself is free for what purpose? And you know what the answer is? To serve God. The freedom that we have through Messiah in redemption by the grace of God is so that we now can serve God as he commands. That should be our utmost desire and the thing that pleases us the most. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to begin in a few minutes with verse 13. Now, we see something as we begin this section. Messiah has moved. There is a new location. And a location that he did not go to frequently, at least what we read in the scripture. He goes there uniquely for a purpose. And that purpose is most informing. So look with me to that verse, Matthew 16 and verse 13. But Yeshua, having come into the region of Caesarea of Philippi. Now pay attention to that. Caesarea Philippi. This is not Caesarea by the sea. This is not the place that Paul went and had judgment being examined by the Romans. This is entirely a different location, Caesarea Philippi. It is in the north of Israel. Outside the Galilee, it is in the Golan Heights, at the foothill of the Golan Heights. And what do we know about that place? Well, remember the name, Caesarea Philippi. That's not a Hebrew term. It's Roman. And the Romans, they were idolaters. And it was a place of idolatry for example you can go if you visit israel you can go to caesarea philippi and you can see the places which have been carved out more than two thousand years ago carved out so people could come and place their various idols there and bow down and make sacrifices to them some even say human sacrifice took place at that location It was a place where people worship, and here's the important point, many different gods. Remember that as we study this passage of Scripture once more. Matthew 16, verse 13. But Yeshua, after coming into the regions of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, saying, and he had a question. Now, when we look at this question in the literalness of the biblical language, it's somewhat awkward. It's almost impossible to translate it literally because, well, he speaks about himself and we would have to say I, but he literally uses a word, me. And what he says here, and let me do the best job I can to render this into English. He's saying to his disciples, who 
Do men, that means people, say that I, the Son of Man, to be? Now, what he wants to know is simply, what do people believe about me, the Son of Man? And as always, his favorite term to describe himself is this Son of Man. Why? The Son of Man is an idiom for servant, one who came not to do his personal desires, but the one who sent him. So he asked the question of his disciples, who are people saying that I, being the Son of Man, who do they say I am? And notice the confusion. And in many ways, nothing has changed. People today are still as confused. Now, through our work, we travel to many different countries. And we, I'm speaking of my wife and I, we are, are amazed by how many people, when you say, have you ever heard of, of Jesus of Nazareth? This one called the Christ. So many places in Africa, in Asia, they have not heard that name in any language, not in their language. They know nothing of the gospel accounts. It's all new to them. And many people, even in the West, they really don't know who Yeshua is. They don't know what he has done, and they don't know what he'll do when he returns. It is vital. It has literally eternal implications that you know who he is, and not just know who he is, but surrender to that. Submit to that. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So he asked, who do people say that I, the Son of Man, is? And here's the answer. Look now to verse 14. But they said, this is the disciples, some, John the Baptist, utterly confused. Many people believed in reincarnation, a false teaching. So some were saying, John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, knowing that prophetically, according to the prophet Malachi, that is Malachi, Elijah comes as a forerunner for Messiah to bring about a restoration, a preparation and preparing, preparing people, restoring them back to a position where they can understand truth. So Elijah does have a purpose, but still others, and this is others of a different variety. They were saying Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So we see none of them get it right. They were all confused. Some were saying John the Baptist, others Elijah. We know that close relationship that John the Baptist ministered. He served with the anointing of Elijah the prophet upon him, fulfilling some of that work of Elijah. Others were saying, Jeremiah the prophet. Why? Jeremiah spoke in the time of, 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 of before the exile, the Babylonian exile, and they knew about the Roman oppression that they were experiencing. So they said, maybe God sent Jeremiah back to instruct us, to give us a second chance not against the Babylonians, but against the Romans. And others just said, oh, he's a prophet. All of them, all of them were incorrect. And most people throughout this world, they're incorrect. So then he asks a different question. Look now to the text, verse, verse 15. And he says to them, but you, meaning in contrast to the people, he says to them, but you, who do you say? Here again, it's the word me, but we would have to say in English, I am. Who are you saying that the Son of Man is? And notice the response, verse 16. Shouldn't surprise us, it's always this way. Who's going to be the disciple that, that has to be first? Always charges through, always blurts out the answer. You know the answer. It's Simon Peter. 
And this is exactly what we see. Verse 16, but Simon Peter answered. He said, you, and there's an emphatic aspect, there's an emphasis on this word, you. You are the Christ, that is, the Messiah. And not just the Christ, the Messiah, but notice what else he says, and this is so important, the Son of the living God. Now, what does that mean when he says the Son, not a son of many different sons that are scattered throughout this world? No, you are the Son, and the implication is the one and only. When the term in this context, the Son of God is mentioned, it speaks to the divinity of Yeshua. Many times people ask me, do you believe that Yeshua is divine? The answer is yes, and I say that emphatically, boldly, and want to shout it out. I believe in the Trinity. Now, God is one, but God is in three persons. Each one individually being God, not less than God, but God in three persons. And this reveals this doctrine, which is biblically supported. There's many things people foolishly say. You know, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. That's true. There's a lot of, of biblical doctrine, theological terms that aren't in the Bible, but it's still true. And it is true that God has revealed himself, the one God, in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And let me say this very, very seriously to you, and it's this. If you don't believe that Yeshua is the only divine Son of God, you will not be in the kingdom of God. It's just that simple. If you don't know his true identity, then you do not have salvation. You have to know that he is, as Peter said, the son of the living God. Read on now to verse 17. And Yeshua answered. He said to him, bless it. I love this. Because when Peter identified correctly that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, what did Yeshua say to him? Blessed are you, Simon, the son of Jonah. In Hebrew, Shimon bar Yonah. I want to emphasize something that's very important. Yeshua calls him by his Hebrew name. Now, up until this time, even though the scripture would refer to Peter by that name, Peter, he, he hadn't received that. This is something that's going to happen now. The scripture simply referred to him because we know that he was later referred to, as we see here, as Peter. But his Hebrew name, the name that people would refer to him by was Shimon. And that name Shimon means to hear, to listen, but not just to hear for the sake of hearing, but rather hearing with the purpose of obedience. And this is vital. When God reveals something to you, you need to be quick to respond in obedience. And let me share with you something that I frequently teach, and that's this. If you do not have the desire to obey God, God, more than likely, will not reveal to you something. You need to be people that say to God, God, whatever, and I want to emphasize that, whatever. No limitations, no restrictions, no conditions. God, whatever you see fit to reveal to me, I'm going to obey it. I'm going to respond to it in accordance with your will. And when you have that desire, God is going to begin to move in your life. He is going to teach you much. You are going to have a different perspective for the scripture. So once more, look at this text. He says to him, this is Yeshua, Blessed are you, Shimon bar Yonah, Simon the son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but 
my father which is in heaven now what does it mean here first of all we see a principle notice that once peter said yeshua you are the messiah the son of the living god the next thing that that yeshua said to him was this you are blessed now you may have uh, a moderately good life you may have food to eat clothes to wear a beautiful home a nice car plenty of money in your bank you may have some financial stability in your life you may have good health and praise god for all of these things but you will not know heavenly blessing true heavenly blessing and this word blessed also relates to happiness you will not have a joy a heavenly joy until you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that yeshua that is jesus christ that he is the son of god and the one that the father sent into this world to redeem you and to redeem all people from their sins it's just that simple so messiah says in this passage of scripture blessed or happy are you simon the son of jonah because flesh and blood and that means this you don't just naturally flesh and blood the natural stumble upon truth it has to be revealed to you and the number one place for god's revelation is right here in this book this is the revelation of god you're not going to find it by studying some other book and i don't know why today so many times people want to to share something and they go to a different source this is the source of spiritual truth this is the only source of spiritual truth now someone may write something that's spiritually true but it agrees with this they 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 say that having derived whatever they say from this book it is the only source of truth spiritually what we need to base our life upon and we're going to come to that principle in a moment so he says flesh and blood did not reveal this to you but my father in heaven now people come to faith because god moves that's why he gets all the glory but do not believe a false teaching meaning this that if god reveals to you that truth well you have to receive it people teach about a irresistible grace nowhere do we see that in the scripture nowhere people encounter the grace of god and unfortunately they rebel against it all the time and there are those who say well they do so until god says enough don't see that in the scripture god and the term here is whomsoever he extends his revelation and whomsoever does it make any difference jew or gentile male or female what color your skin is what language you speak what country you have citizenship in if you hear that gospel whomsoever responds by saying yes to god and what does that mean acknowledging your sinfulness and that he is the redeemer of your sin he is as peter says the son of the living god the one who's anointed to bring salvation into this world so he says flesh and blood did not reveal that to you but my father in heaven also i say and it begins by the word but in contrast but i say to you that you are peter now notice there's a change in name the contrast is a new it's related but a new direction that Yeshua is taking he's saying but you are Peter now we just learned his name Shimon bar Yona Yeshua is changing his name giving him a new name because through that recognition that realization that Yeshua is the only son of God the living God through that we become a new creation and therefore new name a new character and what was his name pay very close attention he says you are peter and upon this rock and it's a play in words because the word peter that name peter means rock in the greek language 
Now, what rock is he referring to? He's referring to that truth, the truth of the identity of Messiah. And here's the key. If you want to build a glorious life, a life that's pleasing to God, a life that is, is accomplishing the things of God, you have to have the right foundation. And that foundation begins, it's founded upon the truth concerning the identity of Yeshua. Until you accept, realize, and surrender to the fact that Yeshua, that He is the Savior, the Son of the living God, you can't build anything. But if your life's built upon that, notice what He says. He's going to build something glorious upon that. He says, you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my, pay attention to this next word, my church. Now, many people believe that this is a, a new word, that it never appeared before, that this is the first time there's a revelation of this concept of church. That is not true. We're studying the New Testament. The New Testament was written in Greek. And the Greek language was also used to translate from the Hebrew the, the Torah, the first five books in all the Hebrew Bible, all the Old Testament. And when there is a reference to the congregation that came out of Egypt, having been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm talking about having a Passover experience. What was that congregation called? What use, word was used to identify them? Well, in Hebrew, the word Eda. But, but, in Greek, the word Ecclesia. So they would have known this word. They spoke Greek. And they would know that he was referring to this congregation in the wilderness who all had a Passover experience. And it's through that Passover blood, and what does Paul say? That Yeshua is our Passover. He died on Preparation Day. All four Gospels attest to that. And Preparation Day is another name for Passover. So it's when you accept the identity of Messiah for your redemption that God goes to work and He builds and he says here he's building a congregation. It uses the word in, in English. We translate it church. And notice this, victory. When you accept as the foundation of your life the truth concerning who Messiah is, what he's done and what he's going to do, and you invite him to be the Lord of your life, notice what it says. And the gates of hell will not, and this is a word for prevailing. It's a word that means strong and to bring down. The gates of hell will not be able to bring down the congregation of redeem. This, this rock of Messiah. This truth concerning the people who have entered into a covenant relationship with him. Now look at verse 19. 19 says, And I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, how does one enter into the kingdom of heaven? Very simple, through that gospel message. This is tying together his identity, who Messiah is, the son of the living God, that he's the Christ, the anointed one, that he's the savior, the redeemer. That's the keys of the kingdom of heaven, how to enter in. And then he says to him simply, and whatever, and he's speaking to each of the disciples. And whatever you shall bind upon the earth, it will be. Now, I'm translating this literally. Here's the problem. Most people understood this, and, and I've made this same error, believing that, that when we act in obedience, God will agree. God will put his stamp of approval on it. Now, that, that may be true. But that's not the intent of the scripture. See, when you look at the scripture, you have to ask yourself a question. There is a unique construction grammatically for, for two of the words in this verse. It is in the perfect tense. Why? You know, in order to have a theological discussion, you need to understand what the perfect represents. And let me just translate this again in the most literal manner. He says... 
I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind upon the earth, it will be having been bound in the heavens. Did you see that? Having been bound, having been bound is the implication of the the perfect tense. Something that has happened in the past, it's true now, and it will continue to be true. So it identifies that God has done something and we are agreeing with him. Likewise, it says, second part of verse 19, and whatever you shall loose upon the earth, it will be having been loosed in the heavens. So it's all of us working to carry out, here's the key, to carry out the purposes of God, what heaven has decreed. It's not our decree that God agrees with. It's his decree that we should agree with. And when we do, it will be upon the earth. So it's a wonderful confirmation of the power of God and his word. Not to think that we decree something, we proclaim it. And because we've done it, God's going to agree. That is heresy. That is a a highly incorrect, a false teaching. Well, one more verse, and we'll conclude. Verse 20. Then he instructed or commanded his disciples, and he said that nothing they should say that Yeshua, that he is the Messiah. And that seems odd, does it not? that he would command, that he would instruct them that none of them should say anything to anyone that Yeshua, that he is the Messiah. Why? Isn't that the whole purpose? Well, we have to go up to where this scripture began. Remember, he says, who do people say the Son of Man? The Son of Man is a theological term relating to the Christ, the Messiah. Who do people say that the Messiah is? They didn't get it right. They were wrong. So Messiah says, shh, don't say anything. Why? Because as we look as the scripture goes forward, he's going to instruct, he's going to teach, he's going to show them what truly the Messiah is going to do. What is his call? And it's only when we understand the call, then we can identify who he is. Well, I'm out of time until next week, and we press on in the 16th chapter. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.